The lesson of perseverance in my life was learned in a very dramatic way when I was a senior in high school. I was on the cross country team and there was a kid from a nearby little town by the name of Dave Kropa who had been defeating me for four years of cross country. And he had an interesting technique. He would sprint at the beginning of a cross country race for two to 400 yards and he would be way out in front of everybody and then he would hit his race pace. But he was so far ahead that he would usually win these races. And so I trained for the entire cross country season and on a cold Saturday morning in October, I decided that I was gonna run with Kropa and I was gonna defeat him. And so I took off sprinting with him and we sprinted for 200 and then 300 and then 400 yards and then I hit a wall. And I jogged for the rest of the race and had the worst race of my entire high school career. And for the rest of that cross country season, I didn't come close to any of my best times. I learned the lesson that perseverance and stick to matters and sprinting out and not being able to finish the race doesn't help and isn't good. These times that we are in are times when perseverance and persons, persistent stick to is absolutely essential. We are tempted to lose heart. And over the last several Sundays, we've been looking at every passage in the New Testament where there is this little Greek word, egkakeo, which means to lose heart. And we've seen that as we are tempted to lose heart, we do so as we're involved in ministry, as we're serving Jesus, we're tempted to lose heart as that gets difficult. Uh, we see our physical bodies wearing out and we are tempted to lose heart. We have injuries, spiritual injuries, and that causes us to lose heart. When we are doing good and we don't see that it's making any difference, that tempts us to lose heart. When we pray and we don't see results, we're tempted to lose heart. When we're doing good and yet our brothers and sisters in Christ are making some horrendous mistakes, it's difficult to keep doing good in those settings and we're tempted to lose heart. Well, as we come to Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13, there is a verse that really is important to the whole meaning of this section of scripture, and it's the 13th verse. Paul says to the Ephesians, so I, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. What does this mean? How can we understand it? We can start by looking at one little word, the word that starts this sentence. It's the little word, so. Uh, you could also use the word, therefore, in the place of that word, so. Whenever you see the word, so, or the word, therefore, you realize that you have to go back and see what was said before, because what was said before brings meaning to what is said after the word so or therefore. So as we look at Ephesians 3.13, in order to understand it, we have to look back at verses one through 12. And if you have a piece of paper and a writing utensil of some sort, I would encourage you to write down uh, Ephesians chapter three, verses one to three, and I'd encourage you to write down the words, a mystery with a question mark, because we find the word mystery in this text. Uh, Paul has a really unique relationship with most of the churches that he planted on his missionary journeys. And he spent a lot of time in the city of Ephesus. It was a, a wealthy city. Uh, he spent a couple years there. He did a lot of teaching a lot of training, 
his relationship with the leaders of the church at Ephesus was incredible. Uh, in Acts chapter 20, there's uh, an episode where Paul says goodbye to the Ephesian elders who were governing the church. And it was a, a very sad time because Paul was loved and the relationship with Paul and the leaders of the church was very close and very good. Ephesus is a lot like other churches that Paul planted. In the church, there were a lot of believers who were Jews. They came out of Judaism. And there were believers who were Gentiles, which is just a way of saying non-Jewish people. And this is a big deal because Paul grew up as a Jew. And as a Jew growing up, he didn't like Gentiles. In fact, he was taught to keep away from them. Gentiles were unclean to the Jew, and so they were to keep away from them. You can imagine in a religious system where a group of people are unclean, the group of people that is thought to be unclean probably doesn't think much of the people who think they are unclean. And so Paul didn't think much of Gentiles and he kept away from them and he was a part of this whole system that taught that belief. As he wrote to the believers in Ephesus, he was actually in prison. And he was in prison because he had been reaching out to Gentiles with the good news of Jesus, inviting them to come into God's family along with Jews. Well, Paul uses an interesting word to describe what he is doing. And he uses the word stewardship. He assumes that they have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. So we think about Paul in prison, writing to the church in Ephesus, this group of Jews and Gentiles, once opposed to each other, Paul looks at himself as a steward of God's grace. God had showered him with grace, and so he viewed it as his duty to steward that grace, to invest that grace, as it were, in the lives of people. And it was his joy to do that in the church. And so the verse three verses of Ephesians 3 introduce us to the fact that there's a mystery that Paul is going to talk about. Well, the second thing you should write down your piece of paper is, what is the mystery? Ephesians 3, 4 to 6 gives us the answer. Paul moves on and reveals a mystery that's in the Bible. And Paul doesn't want this mystery to remain hidden. When we think of that word mystery, we, we might think of a mystery novel, which is a novel which has a perplexing situation that we don't find out uh, about how that situation is resolved until we get to the end of the novel. And Paul doesn't want this, not, this mystery to be hidden. He wants it to be out there for everybody to see. Well, what is the mystery? It's a little complicated, but try this. In Genesis 12, God promised Abraham that all of the nations on earth would be blessed through him. Through the entire Old Testament, the vast majority of God's blessing is basically going to one group of people the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. In 2 Samuel 12, God promises David this, your house 
and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So David was a king of the Jewish people in the nation of Israel, and God said, your throne's gonna be forever. And then throughout the books of the prophets in the Old Testament, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the minor prophets, there are these references to a coming Messiah that's going to impact the whole world. Well, what did all of that mean? It's, it's mysterious because it doesn't seem that it had happened. Verse four, when you read this, you can pursue, you perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. For most of us today, this mystery isn't very mysterious. Most of us know John 3.16 by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, we know that Jews and Gentiles can both be a part of God's kingdom and God's church and God's work. But for Paul, this mystery was a major, major paradigm shift. It, it rocked his world. He'd been living one way his entire life. And then on the Damascus road with bright light, he came to Jesus Christ and all of a sudden everything changed. The way he viewed people was absolutely flipped on its head. I, I saw an example of a paradigm change a couple months ago. There's a, there's a man that I have to meet with a couple of times each year. And so I only see him about every six months or so. Uh, the last time I saw him, a few months back, he was a great deal thinner than he had been. And he told me that he had actually had a heart attack and he is a, a rather young man. And because of this heart attack, he has absolutely flipped his diet. He only eats plant-based food and he's lost all kinds of weight and he says that this is the way he's going to live for the rest of his life because um, he was informed that his condition and his body type is such that this is what he needs to do. He's gone through a whole paradigm shift. Well, Paul had this dramatic coming to Jesus moment and over a period of several years, he knew this mystery very well. He knew the Old Testament very well. But now the mystery is solved in Jesus and in the church taking this good news of Jesus to the world. So this passage tells us that there's a mystery. It tells us what the mystery is but we also should look at the mystery uncovered. Uh, so what? If we have a mystery and we know what that mystery is, now what? Well, write this down as well. Mystery uncovered, now what? Announce it, reveal it, make it known. Verse seven, Paul says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul wants this mystery known. He wants it announced. He wants it proclaimed. He wants it revealed. 
And it's very significant to see how Paul views himself. He, he looks at himself as a minister of the grace of God. A minister is simply a servant. So Paul sees himself as a servant. He sees himself as the very least of all the saints. Paul is humble. He doesn't view himself as anything of significance. He views himself as a proclaimer, a preacher to the Gentiles. And he's got this great message, the unsearchable riches of Christ. But Paul also views himself as one who brings light, as one who enlightens people, helps people understand the mystery. The gospel is a message. It's a message of this unimaginably good news that because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can have eternal life with God and the life with God starts the moment we believe and place our faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is eternal life. This is good news. This actually begins right now on earth today. We have to believe it's true and this belief is called faith. And if you are listening to this message, you can believe and you can place faith in Jesus now. You can start to follow him now and have this life. And this is the richness, the unsearchable richness of, of Jesus. Well, this gospel is called the gift of God's grace. You can't earn it, you can't buy it. You can't be born into the right family to get it. It's a gift of grace. Paul sees himself as a light carrier. He wants everyone to see the unfolding of God's plan in the Bible. God, the creator of all things, is perfect, and his plan is perfect, and his plan is astounding. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are made a servant of the gospel by the grace of Jesus. And because the gospel is a gift of grace from God, you are humble. Getting a gift humbles us. We don't deserve it. And yet, we've been given this great gift. There is nothing that Paul sees in himself in these verses that you shouldn't see in yourself. We are servants of God's grace. We carry the light. We are humble because we realize it's all God's grace. In the world that Paul grew up in, God was associated with the temple in Jerusalem. The temple was equal to God's presence. Now, today, we are each, according to 1 Corinthians 3.16, a temple of the living God. That's a, another little part of the mystery that's been revealed. God once was equal to the temple and his presence was there. Now, believers who place their faith in Jesus are portable temples wherever they go. And so instead of the temple being in one place in Jerusalem, the temple is everywhere that a believer goes. The presence of God goes there. It's wonderful. Thousands and thousands, millions of, of temples out there in the world carrying with them the presence of God. Well, write this down. What is the purpose of the mystery? What is the purpose of the mystery? Verses 10 11 and 12, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. 
This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. I've got to say, these verses are among some of the most mind-boggling verses in the entire New Testament. We could have a strategy session right now. As you're sitting in front of your screens, we could take a little moment, a little five-minute discussion here and have you come up with all kinds of purposes for the church. Well, why does the church exist? Why are we here? We could get specific and say, Calvary Church of Broomfield, why do we exist? What's our purpose? To evangelize, to, to, to reach people with the good news of Christ? Sure, absolutely. To help feed the poor? Yes, uh, to provide fellowship and spiritual, all good things. But these verses give us the ultimate purpose of the mystery and the ultimate purpose of the church. Pastor John MacArthur has written a great commentary on the book of Ephesians. And I'm just gonna read what he writes about these verses because I can't put it any better. The church does not exist simply for the purpose of saving souls, though that is a marvelous and important work. The supreme purpose of the church, as Paul makes explicit here, is to glorify God by manifesting his wisdom before the angels who can then offer greater praise to God. The purpose of the universe is to give glory to God. And that will be its ultimate reality after all evil is conquered and destroyed. Even now, according to Psalm 19.1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. The redemption of fallen people enriches their praise. Redeemed people then are to enhance angelic praise and someday in heaven to join in. <laughs> the purpose of the mystery which we now know about is the same as every other thing that God created. The purpose of the mystery is to glorify God. You may think right now that you're sitting in front of a computer screen watching somebody talk about the word of God and it's just no big deal. But as you're sitting there today, somebody who was once an enemy of God, who is now with God as a friend and as a partner in the gospel, when you're sitting there in front of that computer screen, angels are looking down on you and they start singing, how great is our God, giving God more praise. And all that's happening now, right now. And there's more. <laughs> the mystery also tells us that all people can have access to God through Jesus Christ, Gentiles included. And when we become a child of God, we have boldness and access with confidence because of our faith in him. And so, when we are in a national crisis period, when we are going through deep weeds, we can confidently pray to our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Dad who has our interests at heart. Do you see why the gospel is good news? <laughs> Do you see why the gospel is good news? Well, we end up in verse 13. This is where we started. And we realize that as we come to verse 13 again, we find the words of Paul. 
So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. The mystery of the gospel helps me to persevere. Paul was in prison a lot. (laughs) He was in prison because he was causing trouble. Trouble. Every time Paul was put into a jail cell, it was because he was telling people about the grace of Jesus Christ. He would tell Gentiles, he would tell Jews, and that got him into trouble. He was beat up, he was spit on, he was picked on, he was abused, and he was thrown into jail time and time and time again. And you can understand that if you spent a couple years with a man who poured his life into you, and you heard about all these things atrocities that were happening to him, it would discourage you. It broke the heart of the believers in Ephesus to think of all of the suffering that Paul was going through in prison. And you know the truth of the matter is this, Paul could have stayed out of prison. Paul could have lived to a ripe old age and retired in a Jerusalem nursing home if he would have wanted to. but he didn't. He couldn't keep quiet about the good news of the gospel. And so every time he opened up his mouth, he got into trouble. He saw the mystery and he figured it out and he couldn't keep quiet about it. He wanted everybody to see this mystery. But Paul did not regret one moment he spent in prison. (laughs) Other places in the New Testament where he wrote things indicate this. Romans 8.18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. 2 Corinthians 4.17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Paul was saying to the Ephesians, Look at this mystery of God that was hidden for centuries but is now visible. You guys are a part of that. You're a part of that mystery. And the suffering on my part means that Gentiles are hearing and they are responding to the good news of Jesus. And do you know what that is? Glory. That's bright glory. Don't be down about me being in prison This is all glorious. Well, following Jesus is like walking on a road full of glory and suffering. Following Jesus means reaching out to all people and all nations. This passage causes us to think about Gentiles, and most of us are Gentiles. Most of us are non-Jews. But as we think about who a Gentile was to Paul, and who a Gentile was to most of the Jews that he confronted in the first century, we realize that a Gentile was somebody that they didn't like very much. It was somebody that they didn't think they should hang around with very much. And for us, as we think about Gentiles today, it could mean enemy. It could mean somebody who is putting statements on social media that we disagree with. It could mean somebody who stands opposed to us in everything that we believe. And yet the inescapable truth that we find throughout the New Testament, that we find in Ephesians 3, is that we were once an enemy of God and he pursued us. And now We sit at his table. And that's church. Enemies now together with nothing in common but Jesus. But that's the most important thing to have in common. 
We need to be aware of the fact today that relationships in the United States of America are, are in horrible, horrible shape. We've been isolated from groups of people for months. So we aren't used to rubbing shoulders with people and talking to people and having any kind of a discussion with people about controversial subjects. We have different views of all kinds of things and we've been isolated from one another for a long time. Our hearts are broken by the horrible death of George Floyd and the inequity in our nation. And yet, the mystery that God is about bringing Jew and Gentile into the church together, friends that once were enemies. That was, the, that was the miracle of the first century that caused people to just scratch their heads. What is going on here? Jews and Gentiles together? This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Brothers and sisters, don't lose heart, don't give up. The mystery is revealed right here. The good news is true. Heavenly Father, we're all struggling to persevere, to endure, to not give up, to not lose heart. This passage reveals Paul's heart, his discovery of this mystery revealed. God, may we, as your people, Take the good news of Jesus. It's what the world needs. Every segment of our society needs this good news of Jesus Christ, this gospel. And as we look at the Bible and we see your purpose from the opening pages of Scripture to the end of the book of Revelation, we thank you that you intend to reach people, the most unlikely people, <laughs> people like us. Thank you for that. Use us for your glory in reaching people. Help us to see people as they are, lost people who need you. And we pray that you would receive honor as we do this. In Jesus' name. Amen.